Great, thank you. Thank you, Sheena, and thanks to the Royal Anthropological Society uh, for the invitation to come and speak with you today. Um, I was asked to speak about the kind of intersection between uh, my research work and the outreach that I have done uh, throughout my career to diversify entomology. And so I thought I would start by kind of giving you some background as to why the latter has been so important to me. So I'm one of a set of twins. Uh, my twin and I were born in Canada, uh, and we were born to people who were not academics. So no one in my family really went on to, um, and to do any postgraduate work. My mom was an art teacher and an artist. This is one of her flower pieces that she did. And my dad was a retired Marine Corps drill instructor uh, who sold computers. So they really knew nothing about entomology and even less about kind of the discipline of academia. Uh, my maternal grandparents is where we spent most of our time up in northern Ontario, um, and they really had no um, extra schooling. My grandfather only went to grade eight, but they were outdoors people. So they flipped over logs and took us on, on hikes and really encouraged us to ask questions about the natural world. Um, I knew from seeing people in my life that had jobs that they really just thought were drudgery, that I didn't want to have this type of job. And I never was the type of kid that said like, hey, maybe I'll be an entomologist, because I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I did know that I wanted to do something that was different and something where I could be outside um, and be creative. My twin came out as transgender when we were 20. Um, and he ended up going on to do a PhD studying trans and disability studies. And now he's a professor at McMaster um, in Ontario. And I went on to do a PhD in insect evolution. And it was so interesting because Cyrus was told throughout his schooling, your lived experiences shape your scholarship. And you need to bring your lived experiences into your work because that's the lens through which you're asking your questions. And I was told as a scientist, there's no feelings in science. And you should never bring your lived experience in because we're really only interested in the insects and the data. But because I had this tether, I had this tether to my twin and to this other world, I really have started to question whether or not that's good advice uh, for us to have as scientists. Because um, I'm a field biologist, I, I travel the world to collect the insects um, that, I, that I need for my phylogenies, but my lived experiences really shape the way that I experience field work and the way that I experience science. So for many of us, uh, we've gone through the field, we're always kind of impressed by the amazing diversity that we have of insects. Um, certainly, you know, one and a half, people mentioned this yesterday, one and a half million described species, maybe 10 million more yet to be described, uh, far, you know, um, dwarfing the number of, of things like mammals. Um, when we look across this, this heterogeneity of insects, we see extreme variation in form, uh, function, size, shape. Um, and the groups that I've, mostly focused on for my research career are the odonata, which are the dragonflies and damselflies, and the bladodia, which are the termites and cockroaches. The questions we mostly pose are questions that are systematic and that are taxonomic. So we're interested in asking um, questions that tell us how different insect groups are related to each other. And I'm really interested in the drivers of diversity. And so to answer those questions, we really need to know when, right? The timing of diversification events so that we can figure out what may have driven certain groups to be very species rich and other groups to be rather species poor. Um, and throughout my talk today, as I talk to you about this research, I want us to keep this question in our mind about who's able to access entomology spaces and really ask yourself whether or not everybody's experiencing entomology spaces the same way. So in the United States, we talk a lot about, uh, we call it DEI. We have the acronym kind of switched around. Um, and these hexagons are from a figure from the National Institute of Health uh, that indicate many different types of diversity. Those with an asterisk next to it are ones that uh, our government determines to be um, underrepresented groups uh, in STEM technology, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and certainly if we were to ask any one of us, if we were to talk about it during coffee break, we would all say, yeah, our shared values are that we want everybody to participate. We want everybody to be feeling safe in our field experiences. And we really think that biology is a place for everybody. This is certainly something that I would say, I have it on my website for my lab. But in actual practice as a field biologist, many times we go to places where inherently members of my team may not be safe. So this is a map that shows um, kind of the safest countries and least safe countries for members of the LGBTQAI plus community. Um, and the countries that we mostly do our sampling in, I've kind of highlighted with these yellow boxes, 
And you can see that for some of these countries, including Guyana, where we spend a lot of our time in South America, it's considered to be a country of extreme danger for members of the LGBTQAI plus community. So for those members of my team, I've created this diverse team and I'm taking them to the field, but inherently they may not be safe. They're experiencing this field work in a different way than other people might be experiencing it. Now, someone mentioned yesterday in that great talk about the rewilding of the golf course, about the exposure to green spaces. I was really fortunate growing up in Northern Ontario. I had almost unlimited access to green spaces, lots of fresh water, lots of opportunities to sit by the dock um, and look at dragonflies. These are some photos from Northern Ontario. But this always wasn't the case for my family. So on my father's side, we were brought over to, the, to America in the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, this picture in the middle is of my maternal, of my paternal uh, matriarch, Fanny Ware. Um, and my grandmother is indicated by this red arrow here. Uh, after the period of enslavement ended, um, after emancipation, many Black families were forced into what was called sharecropping. It was basically slavery by another name, where you had to rent land from often the same people who owned your family previously. You had to buy seeds from these owners, um, and you really relied on you know, the success of your crop to prevent your family going further into debt um, and owing more to the, to the people that would end up putting you back into servitude. The crop that we grew was cotton. Um, that's an ironic twist. On my maternal side, they were still in Yorkshire and they actually were spinning and working with cotton in cotton mills, um, which I think is kind of fascinating. Cotton on both sides. So cotton's a big part of our story. And I'm wearing cotton today in honor of this. Anyways, um, so in the beginning of the last 20th century, there was an invasive insect that arrived in the United States called the boll weevil. Um, and this beetle really threatened cotton crops. Um, people were really kind of frantic about it. Songs were written about it. There's a great song by Lead Belly, The Bull Weevil Blues, which you should check out. Um, but people were concerned that this would um, kind of decimate what was a very important crop in the South, and particularly in the Mississippi Delta, which is where my family were sharecroppers. So the United States government put together as much information as they could to control the pest. Um, and they put these scientists on a train called the Southern Agricultural Train that would travel from town to town um, to give information on how to control this new invasive species, except in the Mississippi Delta, because white sharecroppers, white, white landowners didn't want black sharecroppers to get this information because of course it behooved them to kind of keep people subjugated. If you had failed crops because of the bold weevil, uh, you would fall further in debt and further into servitude. So when the train arrived in the Mississippi Delta, which is where my family lived, people weren't at the station. The flyers had been taken down and it was not advertised and the black sharecroppers were not able to get this entomological information. So I kind of find it fascinating that just in a hundred years time, I have virtually unlimited entomological information. I was able to sit yesterday and learn all day about the different entomology work that you all are working on. And this is part of what has driven my mission, really to make sure that everybody has access to entomology and everybody has access to this data. So onto the, <laughs> onto the, the good stuff, to the systematics. Um, so this is a phylogeny that colleagues and I reconstructed using transcriptomes a few years ago. I thought I would use it just kind of as a map to walk us through the insect tree of life. Um, we have basal hexapods, silverfish, columbula, springtails, fire brats, as sister to the winged insects. Um, and the winged insects are kind of divided into the non hola metabolist insect, insects without complete metamorphosis, things like dragonflies, but also cicadas and earwigs. And then the whole metabolists are insects that have complete metamorphosis, things like beetles and butterflies. Dragonflies and damselflies are neat because they're right at the base of the insect uh, tree where, where wings first diverged. Um, and probably they were the first to fly. So before birds, bats, and pterosaurs, insects were the first things in the sky. And probably that insect looked something that was like a dragonfly or a mayfly. Um, dragonflies and damselflies are voracious predators, both in the juvenile stage, which is aquatic, um, as well as in the adult stage. Um, and these juveniles sometimes develop um, over a period of weeks or sometimes up to five years in freshwater. And sometimes when they emerge, they never leave the pond from which they emerged. And others are really long distance migrators that travel you know, 11,000 kilometers. Um, we think they're relatively ancient. We have fossils from around 250, uh, 225 million years old or so. Um, and one of the big stories about dragonflies and damselflies is that they're very colorful. And in line with this color, um, they actually have remarkable vision and can see quite a range of colors compared to other insects. 
We divide um, this order into three extant suborders. The dragonflies are the Anisoptera. There's around 3,000 species of those. The damselflies are the Zygoptera. There's around 3,000 species of those. And then there's this third kind of enigmatic suborder called Anisozygoptera. It exists today only as a single genus, Epiaflavia, with three species, one in China, one in the Himalayas, and one in Japan. It has a body sort of stocky like a dragonfly but wings like a damselfly. And there's around the same number of species of odonates as there are mammals. And yet mammals get far too much attention. Um, there's a lot of extinct suborders as well, one of which was recently described, Cephalozygoptera, um, which is a new um, suborder that they have these kind of remarkable weird shaped heads, which is why it has its name. This is what the juvenile stages look like. So they have a labial mass that kind of shoots outward and allows them to capture, they eat each other, they eat, other freshwater insects, but they can also take vertebrates like tadpoles and small fish. So when we look across dragonflies, we see a huge variation um, in size, um, in shape, um, and certainly in color. So dragonflies have two primary ways of having color on their body. They either have structural pigmentation, rugosities or bumps in their cuticle. When light bounces off of it, it looks kind of metallic green or metallic blue, but they can also have pigment in their epithelial cells and it can migrate up and down to give them a brighter color or a darker color. And they use these color changes in part for thermoregulation, but also to avoid being seen, um, especially after mating, because um, there's lots of predators at the water. They have a kind of unique mating system, and this is part of what we work on in my lab. Um, so males have two sets of penises. They have a penis at the tip of their abdomen and a penis at the base of their abdomen. They ejaculate sperm and put it into their secondary penis. And their secondary penis has been acted on by selection to actually do this other purpose, which is sperm displacement. So these are some SEMs of what the secondary penis looks like. Females can mate multiple times and she stores sperm in her sperm storage organs. Um, males to try and ensure paternity presumably scrape out the previous male sperm before transferring sperm to her. Um, this is kind of a neat system. It's called indirect sperm transfer because they're not directly transferring sperm from their primary penis, but rather from their secondary penis. Um, Females actually have a kind of a unique part of this story too. So females presumably want to have some control over their reproductive output. And so over time, they've been acted on by selection. So they have both a short-term storage, which is presumably where the male uh, append the secondary penis can reach, but then way in the back, they also have long-term storage. We don't know exactly how females choose among the sperm that she uses to fertilize her eggs, but we do know that it's not last in first out. She is making some decisions about um, which sperm she's using to fertilize her eggs. Um, one of the things that has been fascinating to me is that not all dragonflies lay their eggs the same way. There are two main ways that uh, eggs are laid. Um, all damselflies and most dragonflies do what's called um, endophytic overposition. It means that they lay their eggs within plant material. They have a traditional ovipositor. Um, they cut a hole in plant material and deposit their eggs in kind of one at a time. It's really time consuming and their clutch sizes are really constrained by the size of the plant in which they're laying their eggs. But by contrast, there are these two groups, one of which is a superfamily, Libelluloidea, and the family Gompidae. They instead have a reduced or vestigial ovipositor, and they just kind of squirt their eggs out in a clump and tap their abdomens on the water. It's much faster, which might avoid, you know, being them the risk of them being taken by frogs and birds and other things that are constantly eating them at the water. But also their clutch sizes can be quite large because they're not constrained by that finite size of the, of the vegetation. So if you've ever seen dragonflies kind of tapping their abdomen on the surface of the water, or even on the surface of cars or windshields, it's often members of these two groups. That's what they're doing. They're kind of dispersing their eggs. Um, they can't distinguish between the surface of water and the surface of cars. So to really understand the evolution of some of these reproductive strategies, we need to have a phylogeny. We need to have um, a good tree of life for dragonflies. So we're interested in asking questions about which came first, you know, damselflies or dragonflies. We're of course interested in understanding how different families are related, but ultimately my, my goal was to try and figure out um, how many times the ovipositor has been lost. So traditionally, most of the systematics that was done with dragonflies focused on wing venation, in part because this is a really easy character to see. There's lots of wing veins. But of course, wing veins actually impart some stiffness to the wing. So denser wing venation actually makes the wing stiffer. Sparser wing venation tends to make the wing, wing a bit floppier. Um, and so although there are patterns that you see that vary among families, 
Wing venation is not a good reflection of evolutionary history. It's actually strongly correlated with flight behavior. So long distance flyers tend to have stiffer wings. Flyers that are maneuvering in and amongst vegetation tend to have slightly different wing venation that allows for maneuverability. So we tend to not use um, color, uh, we tend to not use wing venation very often in our, in our analyses anymore. So we wanna use these phylogenies to ask questions about the evolution of color. Um, and we're also really interested in this dispersal capabilities. Um, we know that from some of the work that we have for our new um, grant that we're working on right now, which is called GEO, Genealogy um, and Ecology of Odonata, we know that the, group, the groups that have the highest species number tend to have the widest range of color um, and also uh, the widest range of wing shape um, and, and flight behavior. So this is a phylogeny that we reconstructed, um, a tree of life, if you will, for about 130, 136 uh, dragonflies and damselflies, close to 500 genes. Um, we've also reconstructed phylogenies using transcriptomes, close to 3000 genes. Many people would tell you, this is a lot of data. It's actually remarkable to me that we can get this much data now uh, compared to what we did when, when I was in graduate school. But what's neat is that we're starting to kind of converge. So we're finding congruence among studies. It seems like perhaps damselflies are the earliest diverging lineage um, with that third suborder. And this is Lagoptera, a sister to the dragonflies. So um, the ages that we recover using molecular data, molecular age estimates and fossils um, suggest that perhaps damselflies are around 225 million years old. In general, within the actual tree part of damselflies, it's utter chaos. Complete systematic revisions are being done. Um, really, I mean, at one point we thought maybe there were 13 families, now maybe there's 50. So if you like chaos and you wanna work on revisionary systematics, damselflies is a really good group to work on. Um, as I mentioned, that third suborder, the one that exists today only in China, the Himalayas and Japan, we recover this as sister to the dragonflies. It forms this monophyletic group, a group that shares a common ancestor um, called Epiprocta. And it has a unique dis distribution, and we're doing a lot of work looking at um, uh, its biogeography. For dragonflies, um, we similarly recover the age to be around 225 million years old or so. Um, and we feel pretty confident about the relative positions of the different families. But I asked you this question before, I was telling you this question before about the evolution of the, of the loss of this ovipositor. So if we kind of zoom into this part of the tree, we find the two groups that have lost their ovipositor, the ones that just tap their abdomen on the surface of the water, they're not sister taxa. And this suggests to us that this, this behavior, this exophytic egg laying behavior, squirting out your eggs in a clump and tapping it on the surface of the water, it seems to have evolved multiple times. So this was an exciting project to work on and it really got us jazzed about using, uh, we use a lot of museum collections um, to do this anchored hybrid enrichment sampling that we did. But of course, whenever those of us who work with collections start doing this, we have a lot of other questions. And it has to do again with this idea of who's able to access entomology spaces. At the American Museum of Natural History, we have 23 million insect specimens, and a majority of these were collected doing expeditionary work that was in large part due to the colonial legacy of American Museum. We were able to have funds to go and travel um, and basically collect a bunch of insects from the global south, bring it to the global north where we keep it housed. So we are starting to ask questions to ourselves about who um, can access these data and how we can digitize them um, and make them available for everybody. Um, we were interested in finding out whether or not there was usable DNA in any of these old specimens. How old could we go? Um, certainly, uh, we weren't very confident, um, but we were surprised. So we did a test where we looked at um, dragonflies that were up to 100 years old. I think the oldest one we did was from 1909 from the Naturalis Museum in the Netherlands um, and the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and we found that for most of the taxa that we had, we had at least 100 loci that we were able to sequence um, some up to a thousand. Um, and it's important to know whether or not we were just sequencing contaminants or not. So if we look at the phylogeny, I actually just got an updated tree yesterday in the middle of the afternoon session. So we now have 600 taxa in this tree. But if we zoom in, we can see the taxa that were old taxa in our test uh, have red numbers next to it. That's the number, that's the year, um, the date when it was collected. And we can see that congeners and conspecifics are grouping together, whether it was an old sample from a museum or a new sample, which is kind of exciting. 
So we can use these data also to um, figure out where things were, where things are presently, and then we can hopefully make predictions about where things might be found in the future. Um, and we can do species distribution modeling, which is one that we've shown here uh, for pentelopovescence, which I'm gonna to talk to you about in just a moment. But again, it goes back to this question. We have all of these data at our fingertips. And so the rich get richer, right? With these data, we're able uh, to really do some remarkable things. But we worry that uh, we're kind of, again, leaving our colleagues in the global South behind, again, due to no uh, fault of their own, but just the birth lottery of where people are born. Um, so we've been working really hard in our grant to try and ensure that when we do work on taxa, um, whose primary range is, is in the global south, that we have authors from those countries um, in lead roles in the papers that we're writing. So Pantella is one of the dragonflies that is a long distance migrator. Um, it's a migration route has been discovered many, many times. The people who live, there's a really well-known part of its migration route that goes across the Indian Ocean. Uh, dragonflies from India um, travel across the Indian Ocean, stop over in the Maldives um, and end up in East Africa. Sometimes the swarms are 100, 150,000 individuals. I was fortunate enough to see one of these swarms when I was in um, Punjab and it was really remarkable. Um, People who live there have known for a very long time that these dragonflies migrate, but every time um, people who aren't from there arrive, uh, undoubtedly migration is rediscovered. So Colonel Fraser, who is a British uh, military person who is a really well-known odontologist uh, who is stationed in India, he discovered the migratory route of Pantella. My colleague and friend, Charles Anderson, he also discovered uh, the migration route of Pantella when he was doing marine biology work in the Maldives. So it's kind of interesting. It's, someone mentioned this yesterday, just to kind of underscore the importance of reading literature that's not just in English. So every time I've gone to sample dragonflies pretty much anywhere in the world, Pantella is usually the first uh, dragonfly that I've collected. Uh, there's two species in this genus, Pantella flavescens, uh, which is the one that's cosmopolitan, and Pantella hymenia, which goes from Canada, we think, to Argentina and back. These are one of the dragonflies that exploits temporary or transient bodies of water. So they've lost their ovipositor, they have a vestigial ovipositor, and they just tap their abdomen on the water. They don't need to have water that holds plant material, and so they're able to take advantage of kind of water that pools up after rainy seasons. They have very rapid development. So I mentioned some dragonflies can take up to five years in the juvenile stage. This is like five to six weeks. Um, and what's neat is that they have this behavior when wind passes over the surface of their wings, they have these tiny sensors, um, they have a, a reflex to pick up their tarsi. And they do these long distance migrations, but it's not active flapping style flight. They are largely using wind and kind of passively migrating using intertropical convergence zone, which are these winds that go around the equator, except on islands, especially in the South Pacific. So when colleagues have gone to places like Rapa Nui, formerly known as Easter Island, they found that when wind passed over the surface of the wings of Pantella, they actually had a crouching reflex, presumably to avoid being blown out to sea. Um, for a lot of these dragonflies that do these long distance migrations over ocean, it's a suicide mission, right? Many of them don't actually make it and, and salt water is death. They have some unique um, aspects of their, their wings. The highlighted region in red here are the anal vein regions, which are kind of expanded. Um, and we often see this, this is another one of those characteristics um, of flight long distance flyers, things that tend to do lots of gliding, tend to have an expanded surface area, especially at the base of their wing, we think to decrease energy expenditure. So we wanted to know what a population was um, when you have something that is so large and was there panmixia. So we used um, uh, Pantella from the countries that are indicated on this map here, which correspond to the colors in this haplotype network. A haplotype network basically just shows um, various genetic patterns. Each circle is a different genetic pattern in our data set, and the size of the circle indicates the number of individuals that share a particular genetic pattern. So you can see that most of the individuals, regardless of the country from which we uh, sampled them, um, most of them share this one main genetic pattern. And when we do other measures of uh, gene flow, we find that there's widespread gene flow. Individuals from Japan are mating with individuals from Guyana, with, from Texas and from Australia. We can also do other way, we can also find other ways to measure whether migration is occurring. So I mentioned dragonflies and damselflies have freshwater nymphs, they develop in the water, and their wings actually develop when they're in the water. So the hydrogen in their wings comes from the hydrogen in the water in which they're developing the H2O. 
Um, but it turns out that hydrogen actually varies in its weight along a longitudinal and latitudinal gradient. So you can cut the wings off of an adult dragonfly and combust them. Um, and you can measure the weight of hydrogen and it will tell you whether the dragonfly that you caught in Texas emerged from water in Texas or whether it emerged from water in a different country or a different continent. Um, and you can kind of get these heat maps. It's, it's pretty remarkable. So these are some of the data that we have for the countries that are listed here with these kind of colors that indicate the colors of the dots. And we find that a majority of the Pantella that we sampled are migrants. There were a few though, especially ones from the Andes that were listed as being uh, local or they had signatures that suggested that those dragonflies, those Pantella had emerged from water in the region uh, where it was collected. But all of those were museum specimens and they were what we call tenoral or shiny. So they had just recently emerged. Maybe their destiny was to go on a long distance migration, but some odontologists had collected them. And that made us wonder whether maybe we needed to be looking more long-term and do long kind of um, over an entire 12 month period sampling of Pantella to see whether or not there's variation in migratory or resident populations. And to do this, we started collaborating with people um, in the Black Odontology Working Group, in particular with Gehendi Kemembota at the University of Lagos in Nigeria. Um, and Pantella is a great group to kind of talk about diversity and inclusion because it's entirely global. And so we really can involve people from uh, many countries in the world. It's found everywhere except for in, in Antarctica. So the Black Odontology Working Group, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, was formed in 2020. Um, and it has members from um, Ghana, from Jamaica, um, from the United States, from a kind of across a Black diaspora. This is an article that was written about it a couple of years ago. In general, I would say I feel rather optimistic about odontology. The first dragonfly meeting that I went to, I was one of only two women that was there. And at the time, men carried their nets, um, their dragonfly nets in a bag. Um, and so they used to call women net bag holders, and they would even have program in the program booklet, it would be the program for researchers and the program for net bag holders, where you would get to go look at quilting things and, and do very feminine things. Um, and that has changed. So this is a photo from the last World Dragonfly Association meeting in 2019, uh, where all of the women that were there, we kind of came together for this group photo. Um, so I do feel very optimistic about, um, about the future of odontology. I thought I would just briefly mention some of our work on termites. This is a different part of the tree of life of insects. Uh, termites are a type of cockroach within the Dictyoptera. Over time, people have really converged on a pretty solid phylogeny uh, for termites. There's not a super lot of debate about the relative position of the families um, of, of termites. Um, but what's interesting about termites is that what we're, I guess what we're trying to get at is how diet has driven the diversity in termites. So termites consume wood, but they don't just consume wood. They also consume grasses and detritus, um, as well as some of them being fungus feeders. A lot of the cellulose that they consume, they cannot digest without the aid of endosymbionts, which may be protists or bacteria. Um, and so as different termites have evolved different diet preferences, so too have their hindgut endosymbionts evolved. Um, we've been really interested in my lab in looking at mandibular morphology. So the mandibles inside of termite, in, in termite mouths actually really vary dramatically uh, for functional reasons, depending on whether they're kind of scooping and shoveling soil and detritus into their mouth or cutting wood um, or carrying bits of fungus. My former graduate student, Megan Wilson, got really jazzed about working on uh, ectoparasitic fungi of termites. So termites, just like ants, uh, kind of crawling around in the dirt, they get infected with a lot of fungi, including the zombie ant fungus. This is a particular fungus that we described um, that infects amatermes. The fungus is called termitaria um, in the genus termitaria, and it has these six-sided pads um, that are kind of remarkable. Um, and so we did a complete review of the ectoparasitic fungi in termites last year. Um, and one last thing I'll mention is that we've been kind of fascinated by um, the ability of female termites to actually really distend her abdomen. This bottom photo is of a queen. She's become extremely descended, full of, of eggs. Um, but there are other um, termites like this worker, this unfortunate amateur muse worker in the top, that his body just basically burst from ingesting um, soil uh, when we were in the middle of collecting it. So we've been looking at cuticle strength um, and kind of looking at how females are able to distend their abdomen kind of the mechanisms um, of this kind of extreme change in, in, in body size. So as curator um, at the American Museum, I'm responsible for the Alfred Emerson <coughs> collection of termites. Um, and we have the largest termite collection in the world. 80% of the world's types are there. Um, but what's so neat about Alfred Emerson 
is that he was a PhD supervisor of my hero, my heroine, uh, Margaret Collins. She was the first Black woman to get a PhD in entomology um, in 1950. And for any of you who have ever, well, I experienced this too sometimes, she really wanted to do field work. Um, he had a really active field program in Guyana, was a prolific collector. Um, but he had this idea that women weren't designed for field work. So she was prevented, she was forbidden from going to the field. Um, so she was really able only just to work with specimens that he had brought back from Guyana. She did end up going on to being quite a prolific field biologist. She even built the Alfred Emerson Termite Field Station in Guyana in 1977. Um, but while she was going through her life, um, you know, publishing work on reticulotermies, on azutotermies defensive secretions, she had this lived experience that really shaped how she was able to access entomology spaces. She was invited to give a talk at a white university, University of Florida. A bomb threat was called in and they canceled her talk because they would not allow a black woman to give a talk. After she would write her paper, she would put her children to bed. She sat on her front porch with a shotgun because the KKK kept coming to put burning crosses on her lawn and to threaten to, buy, to firebomb her home. That is a lived experience that's shaping the way that she's accessing entomology spaces and shaping the way that she accessed her research. Um, it is kind of daunting. I feel overwhelmed even in my 2020 life to imagine how much work she was able to accomplish and publish um, while also sitting with a shotgun on her porch in the evening. It's kind of blows my mind. Um, so if you haven't read about her, I encourage you to look her up. She really had a remarkable life. Um, in my office, one of the first things that I inherited when I got my job was this portrait that, of Alfred Emerson that his daughter had painted for him of him in the 1920s. Um, and my former graduate student, Megan Wilson, is an artist. So she painted this portrait of uh, Margaret Collins to sit with him in my office, which is nice. So I get to see her every day. So I've certainly not experienced any of the, the trials that, that Margaret experienced, but I will say that sometimes collecting termites has been perilous, certainly for African-American people, uh, especially if you're collecting in the South of the United States, it can be quite dangerous. Um, and when I have been collecting termites along the border of Arizona and Mexico, um, we were routinely stopped by border patrol. Uh, being a brown person walking along the border, admittedly, we did have pickaxes and, and axes and Asperger's do sort of look like drug paraphernalia, but we were routinely stopped and it was quite scary because I, you know, those uh, people can be rather intimidating. Uh, as I mentioned, we do a lot of sampling in Guyana, a lot of the termite work we've done in Guyana. Um, and for my children, one of my children is trans, uh, we really had to face three weeks of being on edge. If he had gotten sick and I had had to take him to the doctor, um, what would I have done? What would I have said? He presented as male, uh, but was biologically female. This shaped my ability to do my research and it really affected the decisions that I made while in the field. I experienced the field in a different way than some of my colleagues that were there. So again, this is just something that we, we really need to be mindful of. We need to be thinking about who's able to access entomology spaces um, and the decisions that we make. So with colleagues and I, we kind of asked this question in a more academic framework. Um, we wrote a paper called Why Diversity Matters Among Those Who Study Diversity. Uh, we did a couple of things in this paper. We looked at when the first um, people of color had received PhDs in entomology. And not surprising for the United States, many of these firsts had been rather recent. I actually learned through doing this work that I was the first Black person to get a PhD in entomology at Rutgers, which is surprising because it's quite an old institution. We looked at data from the National Science Foundation. We find that the, there's extreme um, underrepresentation. The amount of gray in these circles indicates the amount of underrepresentation. Extreme underrepresentation for members of the Black and Hispanic diaspora in entomology. And you may have heard this, this analogy of a leaky pipeline that for women, um, they start out in, in undergrad and then they kind of, in this analogy, women are the water and they're kind of leaking out of this pipeline as you go towards being an employed scientist. But when we look at for the numbers for women of color, the numbers start low and stay low. And some colleagues have instead coined the phrase that it's a hostile obstacle course. It's not a leaky pipeline where women passively leak out. It's actually a hostile obstacle course that actually prevents people um, from reaching the, the finish line. This is same can be said for our members of the LGBTQAI plus community who experience who report experience her, experiencing harassment and um, less than 60% of people are out in STEM um, in their work. That again is shaping the way that they're experiencing their entomology spaces. In the United States, we have actually very recent protections 
Um, in 2016, trans students were protected in the classroom. And only last year did it become illegal for you to be fired based on your sexual orientation. Um, Lauren Esposito at the California Academy of Sciences, um, perhaps in part to kind of uh, do a visibility campaign, started 500 Queer Scientists. Um, she had this goal that perhaps 500 queer scientists would make profiles that could be searchable and could create a sense of community. Now I think there's almost 2,000 profiles that are in this database. Um, and there's quite a few other groups that have kind of sprung up um, to really provide support and community in STEM. She actually recently had a neat um, exhibit that was at the California Academy of Sciences, and now it's at the University of Maryland. It's touring around called New Science, which aims to kind of profile um, scientists, not just in entomology, that are different members of the LGBTQAI plus community. In our society, for the Entomological Society of America, we've done quite a few culture surveys. And while the numbers of minoritized individuals are far lower than what we would expect based on human demographics, the numbers of, of respondents who identified as members of the LGBTQAI plus community is actually um, very close to what we would expect based on human demographics. And I think it's in part because of the social initiatives that we've put in place to really try and encourage people to be welcome um, and to feel like the society is their home and they can, they can experience this entomology space fully. Our governing board is really heavily focused on, on DEI or EDI. Um, and one of the things that we did was we hired a permanent position, Stacey East, who's a director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and she's gathered a bunch of federal funding already since she was hired in 2020 um, to really kind of do this diversity matters initiative um, to increase participation, particularly in public health. And lastly, I'll just mention for NSOC, we had the Better Common Names Project, which won an award this year. Our goal was to try and remove, we can't really do a lot to change the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature Rules, the like genus and species, but for common names, um, there was quite a few that are rather pejorative. Um, and so we worked to try and change, the first two we changed, one was spongy moth and the other is the Northern Giant Hornet, um, to really try and make it so that people don't have to feel a negative slur about their culture or people when discussing the insects on which they're working. Certainly in 2020, this kind of galvanized people to start talking more about race and talking more about EDI or DEI. Um, and during that year, a bunch of different groups kind of sprung up, Black in chemistry, Black in natural history, Black in, in what have you. We had one that was called Black in entomology or Black in ento. Uh, we had our first uh, meeting in 2021, um, and we're going to be having another one in 2023. Um, but we had a bunch of content where we had import what we felt like were important discussions to be having for entomology. Um, colonialism and entomology was one thing we discussed. Um, as well as intersectional um, identities and entomology. All of the content that we created for this week is available on our YouTube playlist. It's static and available for use in classrooms and what have you. There also is a Black and Natural History Museums Week that the American Museum was heavily involved with, as well as Miranda uh, from the British Museum uh, was also uh, involved in this initiative. And they're actually having an event coming up in just a couple of weeks. We noticed that cost is a barrier to membership for entomological societies, but of course, when you're a member, you get all of these perks, right? You have access to these journals that are behind a paywall. Um, you sometimes get cheaper registration. And so with colleagues, we started a group called Entomologists of Color or Ento POC. And the goal of this group was really just to provide free um, memberships to entomological societies. So if you go to our website or point your students to this, um, there are these drop down menus. People can, uh, students of color can select up to three memberships um, per student and we're happy to pay for. Uh, we highlight the students that receive these memberships on social media as sort of a visibility campaign. And so far we've given away over 350 memberships. So in general, um, as I mentioned earlier at the Women in Entomology Breakfast, you know, entomology is what unites us and what brings us together. And I'll just end on a perhaps slightly somber note to say, what does this mean in terms of insect decline, right? Um, we know that the, probably the, the majority of insects that are out there are in the global south um, and in tropical areas, uh, but those aren't, and we, this was mentioned yesterday in one of the talks, those aren't necessarily the people who have access to the capacity to do some of the research on insect decline. Um, we also know that people who are going to be most impacted perhaps by climate change are, are those people, especially really at the food security that are in the global south. So with colleagues, we have a new grant 
It was just announced in, in August. Um, so with Christy and Dave, uh, Eliza and Chris, um, it's a research collaboration grant, um, a research collaboration network grant to kind of ask um, some questions about insect decline and synthesize some of the data and hopefully collaborate with members of Glitters uh, and, and Druid um, to kind of tackle some of these questions um, and make sure that everybody has access to these data. I would say insect decline, like all of the things that I talked about today, really, these are all global questions. Um, and we, we really need global participation and global solutions. Um, these are some photos of my kids when they were younger. They're teenagers now, 17 and 14. They probably would be <laughs> embarrassed that I'm even showing you this photo of them. But they used to be really jazzed, not so much now. But they used to be really jazzed to go out and collect insects, just as I was. Um, and I see, I saw in them, and I see in them kind of the same curiosity, the same love of the natural world. Um, this is something that unites us as humans. We're curious primates. Um, there's far too many insects out there to be described before they go extinct. We're facing kind of catastrophic problems ahead. There's no reason at this point for there to be any barriers to participation. We need everybody to be working on these problems. With that, I'll say thank you and thank my funders, um, my team that I work with in my lab. Um, and if there's time, I'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was absolutely fantastic. That was an amazing combination of um, diversity initiatives and brilliant science as well. So thanks so much. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, first of all, hi, I'm Nalini, I'm from Singapore, and uh, I'm a bit emotional actually because it's almost everything that you mentioned resonates strongly for um, my own academic background. So thank you, first off, and I echo also what she just said, that science is also brilliant, which is just an additional plus. So I was curious about, of course, the sex part. Right, of these um, incredible um, insects that are able to manipulate fertility. So you were mentioning that there are female mediated mechanisms of bias in fertility. And you know, you said you weren't very sure, but could there be any um, indication on the differences in the morphology of the long-term storage and the short-term storage for whether it is an immediate mixture in, in the um, in the clutches, maybe the early clutches have a greater mixture and then the later clutches may have biased fertility. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. What we know is that um, the long-term storage is much smaller um, than the short-term storage. Um, and we know that females sometimes actually give no sperm to her eggs. So sometimes her eggs are actually just empty clutches. We know that um, in the short-term storage, at least, she can secrete caustic chemicals that will actually digest all of the sperm and kind of clean it out. We don't know if she can do that with the long-term storage. Um, so we're not exactly sure... Um, I guess to answer your question, we don't really know. It's possible that, 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 that there's some variation, um, but certainly it seems like um, part of the story is that uh, she's not necessarily giving the same ingredients to each clutch. There is variation among clutches, um, and we're not exactly sure what triggers the release of this caustic chemical, which has actually only been found in one damselfly that they tested. Maybe it's more common in other groups. Um, th this kind of house clean cleaning that she does where she kind of cleans out her bursa copulatrix. Um, I think that what's neat is that it turns out that, I didn't mention this, there wasn't time really, but males also don't always give sperm. So sometimes they actually just give seminal fluid um, and very little sperm. And so the relative ingredients that go into this kind of mating combination, we still know very little about for dragonflies. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have an online question from Christopher Williams. And he says, what in your opinion is the major threat to dragonflies? Is it climate change or is climate change or habitat destruction more of a threat? Um, 
can it be both? Do they have to be mutually exclusive? They might be both happening at the same time, I would say, Christopher Williams. Um, I think that for dragonflies, there's a lot of variation, you know, 6,500 species. It's a lot of heterogeneity and what their preferences are. Some things could be in a puddle. I mean, I, I joke that Pantella probably could lay eggs in a Coke can and be just fine. Um, but there are others that are really very particular. So what we've seen in general for aquatic insects is that as uh, particularly in the United States, freshwater and clean water acts have been put in place um, and freshwater remediation has, has occurred, we see a higher diversity um, of odonates. So it's so freshwater and habitat definitely is an important part of kind of maintaining species richness. Um, but dragonflies are, some colleagues have coined the phrase climate canaries. So they're pretty good at leaving when the going is bad and going new places when the going is good. But what that does is it actually really affects communities. So we're seeing a lot of um, species being displaced by southern um, odonates that are now moving further north. We have dragonflies that used to only be found in kind of northern Africa, southern Europe that are now well established in northern Sweden. Um, and what that what that does to the Arctic uh, dragonflies is kind of displaces them in their habitat. So and that's directly related to climate change. So I would say both of them are, are pretty important factors. I, I don't I can't pick just one. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for a really inspirational talk. Um, it really resonated with me when you were talking about bringing your lived experience to your science. And I think you should be doing more of that. Um, the thing that I want to ask you about is uh, you were talking about recognizing and bringing in people from from the places where most of the biodiversity is reflected into your work and, and your publications. It's something that we were talking about a couple of people yesterday, actually. And um, I'd be interested to know more about how you do that. I do think we're at a really good uh, time point to start doing this. I think the internet really has made uh, people a lot more accessible and have made our own research a lot more accessible. Um, certainly for getting members of the Black diaspora to participate. Now is the time, right? There's Black in whatever group that you want to study. Uh, I bet you that there's a group that's already formed. Um, and so kind of being able to plug into those groups and, and make real collaborations um, that actually involve everybody being able to make decisions um, and having a budget uh, can be really meaningful. So I think um, I guess I don't have a, a, an easy solution other than to say that um, uh, for the group that you're interested in, there probably is already a group that's galvanized. If you can't find them, you could reach out to Black in Ento. You could reach out to entomologists of color because um, we have literally hundreds of, of names of people that we might be able to point you in the direction of as well as 500 queer scientists. Okay. Thank you. There's a question at the back. Hi, Jessica. Thanks so much. Just Lee Tiller here from the Royal Entomological Society. Uh, what a man who worked all both in its research and this all the sort of cultural community and experiences and implications of it. Um, at the RES, we have some experience now of our move to more online meeting situations and providing safe spaces for LGBT plus people to, to talk from countries that are least safe for that community. Mm -hmm. Um, what yeah, what guidance would you have for those of us who are fortunate to live in societies where it is a lot safer to be a black community to help our fellow researchers that might be based in South America or Africa or, or, or Asian countries where it's, it's, it's much more difficult to be uh, in that community? Yeah, that's a really good question, Luke. Um... Well, I would say one thing is that we do kind of have the luxury of being able, I could just stand up here and tell you my son's trans and not feel afraid. I mean, I felt a little bit afraid, but I don't feel terribly afraid that something bad's going to happen. So it's really, our, I think, our responsibility to advocate for LGBTQAI plus people worldwide. So that's one thing that we can do is we really do have a lot of rights and we can use our voice because we can. Um, but then certainly when we, when we collaborate with people, um, we often try to, you know, 
um, bring people with us who we know. Um, if we can help try and identify with people or we talk to people, sometimes who we feel like are trusted in country. We've done this in Guyana. Of course, there's lots of queer and trans people in Guyana. Um, and so we've kind of talked to with people who we feel safe with to try and identify those people and encourage them to come with us on our journeys, to come with us as kind of a team, you know, shouldered and, 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 and kind of um, in a large group, there's safety in numbers. Um, and so they're able to get the entomology experiences with us. Um, kind of being the, the shield, I guess, around them um, in, in these field situations, which are often quite remote. Um, so I would say that that's one thing to do is to really try and, if you can, try and find ways to incorporate them into your science um, and give them the space that you need. For our society, for Entomological Society of America, we have a lot of grants that are dedicated to um, kind of bringing people of color to our meeting, and they're not dedicated to bringing people of color who are also queer to our meeting, but invariably that seems to be the people that we end up recruiting. And um, so being able to bring people um, and then help plug them into other programs that would allow them to do internships or exchanges um, has been really transformative. I know of a couple of students in particular that for them that really changed, that was kind of life-changing. Um, so I think we can have, um, uh, we can have impact uh, funding some things that actually also have this other additional benefit for members of our queer community. I don't know that there's one easy solution, but although I find it very scary sometimes, uh, I do think that one of the most powerful things we can do is for you and I to really be loud um, and to really be very vocal um, because the retribution that would come to me is far, um, far well, it's not as bad as what some of my peers are facing um, in their home countries. Now I'm going to take this one as the last question, just because we have another session starting at 10 o'clock over in LMS. So if anyone wants to go to the society engagement, do feel free to, to get up and leave while we do these next questions. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm sorry to you. Um, thank you for a um, great talk. I was, um, I was wondering about the kind of intersectional aspects, because you were mentioning there's um, like Queer 500 and there's Black Initiative as well. I was wondering if there's, um, if you know of any initiatives or even possibly to kind of like put together kind of stuff where it's looking at the intersectionality. So people who are LGBT who are also disabled, how that could affect um, their field work. Yeah, I don't know of any one particular resource. Certainly for Black and Into, we really tried. Um, to have Black and Into be uh, a group that really reflected all of the aspects of the human condition. Um, and I think, I mean, I guess speaking as someone for NSOC, in theory, that's what we're trying to do for NSOC too, is really have NSOC be one giant Black and Into, right? One giant um, uh, resource for disabled entomologists or, or what have you, um, with mixed success, of course, right? Because these things sometimes get pushed back and take time. Um, so I don't know, I think that um, 500 queer scientists similarly um, their focus isn't just on queer scientists, but it's really on all aspects of the human condition, uh, which comes with, I mean, the intersectionality that we're experiencing is that we're experiencing intersectional um, bias <laughs> against, you know, uh, from multiple angles. And so uh, I think queer, uh, 500 queer scientists is really focused on a lot on that, on some of their programming and workshops. Definitely. So check them out. <laughs> okay. okay. We can just thank Jessica for an absolutely amazing Thank talk. you. Thank you.